Angeles. I don't remember his name right now or where he was from. But when I walked, when this man walked in the building, I was sitting down. So this man did not see me walk at all. And as everyone in this room knows, I walked with the lamp. I was born inside of it. But, but um, so the man, like, he he was he was done with his, his sermon. He was going around and he was prophesying or whatever. And um, he went over to, and of course I used to go to this church. And, um, but he didn't know me at all, hadn't seen me walk. And he, he called me out. And he said, God said that the healing is, is yours if you'll partake in it. And I was like, all right, whatever. And um, and so he and the spirit was just all over the place. And and I, I mean, it was it was just all over the place. It was insane. I, I don't, I've, I've, I've experienced God that hard, but it's been a very, very long time. And um, so he told me to go to the front. And he said that he had healed, or not, he had not healed, but God had healed a, a person with through this man um, that had spina bifida. And so he told me to go to the front, and I sat at the altar like it. There's like this this bench thing at the altar at that church, and um, and he said, "Put your legs out." And I'm not kidding. We I saw the difference, the the length difference between my left and right leg, and we were praying, and I watched my left leg grow. I am not kidding. I mean, it is on camera. Someone had videoed it, and I was so 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 discouraged. When I walked out of that church with a limp. But I'm not up here to talk about me walking out of a church with a limp. I'm up here to say that I texted Colton that night. It was like 9 30. I was like, Colton, I need to talk. And so Colton, who had to get up at 3 30, 4 o'clock that next morning, was on the phone with me at 10 30 at night because Jesse was at work. And he said, Well, you need to call Laura. Y'all need to talk about healing. So I called Laura. And Laura began to tell me about and I research the story so that's shame on me but these people that had leprosy in the Bible there was like five people or something and they were healed and only one turned back to praise God and I don't want to be the four that didn't turn back to praise God because he may have not healed no limp my limp may still be here and it may still be here ten years from now but I can tell you one thing my back don't hurt I can stand up I can stand up straight and it don't hurt I can stand up straight and it don't hurt so I know that God did something. I know he did something. I may have not seen it that night. But you know what? That's okay. That's good. The man that was blind in that place that starts with me that I can't say. He healed him in stages. God doesn't always have to heal right then, right there. Because you know what? My limp may still be here, but I know what he can do because I watched my leg grow. I know what he can do. I know that during this time, he's just increasing my faith. So I know that my day is coming, whether it be 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, maybe it'll be, I know it'll be when I'm in heaven. But it may be uh, that that amount of time before my limp goes away, but I know that God is doing something because I can sit up straight and it don't hurt me. So um, I just didn't want to be the four that didn't turn back to praise him, so praise you. Praise God. Yeah, give the Lord a hand. Hallelujah. Such good time in you sharing that tonight. I'm preaching about the power within you. The power of God. Miracle working power. We need to see more of that type of power. Amen. The world is saturated with so many special effects of Hollywood and can't hardly tell the difference between real and, and fake. They're told so many different things now in the world and given advice that's not biblical and they when you get enough people believe in one thing they start thinking it's right but God has called this last day's remnant to exhibit the power of Almighty God because I want to guarantee you something the devil can try to imitate but he cannot compete with the real power of Jesus Christ there's nothing he can do that will come close to the true power of Jesus Christ and I stretch your hand this way we need the anointing tonight we need God to move tonight Spirit of the living God, we ask that you anoint your messenger. My Lord, we felt your power in this building so many times. We've heard your voice so many times. God, specifically, what is it you want to say to your church tonight? What is it that you want to express from your heart to ours? Because God, whatever it is, we open ourselves and we are ready. Now speak to us, Lord. Guide us, direct us. 
May your anointing flow in this service in the next several minutes, we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen, 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 amen. Amen, amen, amen. Oh, oh, I feel so much anointing. So much anointing of the Holy Ghost. If you want to read with me, it would be such an honor to have you read out loud. First, Chron First Chronicles 29, verse 11. He's about to get back there. and We're going to read this together. The power within you. Beginning with First Chronicles, chapter 29, and verse 11. Let's all read this together. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty, for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Whether you know it or not, you just preached a message to somebody beside you. <laughs> Woo, you just preached a message about how great our God really is. All power belongs to God. Amen. President Abraham Lincoln said, Nearly all men can stand or handle adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. How true that is. You've probably seen examples of that in your lifetime where that people were given power. They were exalted, and some of them made the mistake of allowing pride to take the place of wisdom. And they, what we call, fail, uh, perhaps, from a place of grace. Uh, it's a sad day when people become haughty in their giftings and callings. We must always be careful about that. But the fact of the matter still remains that when someone has total power, there is a potential for a falling and a potential for corruption. So it amazes me even more when I talk about our God to know that he has all power and never once in all of his existence has he become corrupt. Never once has he tried to take advantage of you or me. Never once has he lied. Now you want to imagine something that's hard to believe. Imagine you going through the time since you've been able to talk until today and saying you've never lied in your life. That would be amazing in just 30, 40, 50, 60 years or more. But yet God has existed from time beginning and he has never one time told a single lie. Doesn't that amaze you? And that cause you to marvel at the greatness of God just to know a simple thing like that, that God cannot lie. He is all powerful, and yet he does not take advantage of us with that power. His actions testify of who he really is. Much of God's power is seen in nature. Romans 1 and 20 reads this way. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I want to talk about some uh, amazing things found in nature. Number one, lightning amazes me. Some people get scared, they duck, and they run in a house and try to hide in a basement at the first striking or flashing of lightning. I don't know how you are. Other people like to stand out and watch it. <laughs> they think it's God's light show for them. Listen to this. Earth experiences nearly 1.4 billion flashes of lightning every year. Just one bolt could power 56 houses for one day. Just one bolt. 56 houses for one day. It's amazing the power that we still have not come close to matching with electricity of our own. Let's talk about water. At sea level, air presses down on our bodies at 14.5 pounds per square inch. But if you were to go to the deepest part of the ocean, just to show you the power of ocean's pressure, if you were at the bottom of the ocean, the pressure of water would feel like one person holding 50 jumbo jets on the palm of his hand. Amazing. The pressure, and yet God created an, uh, mammals, fish, uh, animals such as whales, octopuses, other types of animals that can literally withstand the pressure of that water. What about wind? How many has ever been caught in a tornado or had one nearby? Maybe you've lived near the Gulf and you've experienced a hurricane. I did studies on both. Hurricanes can reach speeds up to 156 miles per hour and extend 300 to 400 miles in diameter. 
A tornado works on a smaller scale but can be more devastating at times because it gets up to, up to 300 miles per hour and has a diameter of two miles wide. No one still has yet to devise uh, machines to produce a constant wind such as that, especially as a hurricane, yet. And yet God, thousands of years ago, designed every bit of it. What about thunder? With the distance between the sky and the earth's surface, the level of power for thunder is 120 watts, which is 10 times louder than, a, I think it's supposed to be decibels, I'm sorry, 120 decibels, which is 10 times louder than a jackhammer drill or comparable to standing next to a jet during takeoff. The volume of thunder is equal to the sound of standing next to a jumbo jet. God's nature is amazing. And the power that he instilled within his own nature itself blows our minds even today. Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. If you've ever felt closer to God when you get out in nature, there's a reason for that. Because nature testifies of its creator. Nature screams at us at the top of its lungs. Look how great of a work God has done. Nature shouts with praise as the trees swing in the wind and the uh, limbs clap the leaves together in worship unto the King of kings and Lord of lords. Nature shouts in praise as you stand on the beach and ocean waves come in with that awesome sound that sometimes we buy those machines that make ocean wave sounds to cause us to go to sleep. But when you stand on an actual beach and you hear those massive waves come in, you think, wow, how nature itself is worshiping God just with the way of the ocean. Everywhere we turn, nature testifies. We look to the animal kingdom and the insects and we see the cycle of life and we're amazed at the structure with which God designed every living creature and the food chain and how everything works together in order. You know what that means? That means there's even a purpose for you. <laughs> if God made the ants in your yard, there's got to be a purpose for you. God is amazing. Nature testifies about his greatness. And oh, look out. You testify even greater than all the animals combined. Because Michael White and David Sherman and, and Brother Ricky Simmons and Brother Ed Phil and Phyllis Barrett were made in the image of God. Y'all take a good look at Ed. Isn't that amazing? You were made in the image of God, Brother Neil. You weren't made, you weren't carved and chiseled out of, of a look-alike angel. You were created in the image of the God of the universe. Amazing. Every day that you pull the sheets off your body and you get up and you jump in the shower and begin to wash and get ready for work or school, wherever you're going. You look in that mirror and you begin telling yourself, I am blessed and highly favored because I am made in the image of my daddy. We've been made in the image of our God. How powerful is our God? Well, God has often used nature as a means of uh, exhibiting his power. Some ways are like these. He created light just by saying so. <laughs> Let there be light. He caused the heavens to release rain and the uh, depths of the earth to burst open and water came from both uh, ends, north and from below, and it covered the entire earth to a point where only Noah and his family and the animals were spared from destruction. God can use nature in other ways. Matter of fact, he manufactured ten plagues that came against Egypt just to prove he was God and Pharaoh was not. <laughs> Woo, hallelujah. Hallelujah. He sent a wind that split the Red Sea right down the middle. All night long it blowed, and it was so powerful that by the time the Israelites crossed over, the Bible said they walked on dry land. He walked in the midst of a fiery furnace and let the whole world know, including Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar, that you may stir up the fire, but I've still got control over the heat. Oh, hallelujah. He let the three Hebrew boys know that if you'll show up and you'll stand up for what's right, I'll show up and stand up for you. That fiery furnace could not do any harm to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the Bible even says that not even the smell of smoke 
was on their clothing by the time they left the furnace. What else did God do? He brought life to barren wombs, such as women like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Hannah. He orchestrated the miraculous birth of Jesus, showing that I can even control nature and bypass my own laws of nature that says that only a male and female can produce a child. He said, I'll take a virgin and plant a seed by the Holy Ghost power within her, and she'll give birth to an undefiled, sinless, spotless, blameless Son of God. God controls nature and gets glory through itself. What else did he do? He raised Jesus from the dead, defying the laws of death, hell, and the grave. Let's get a little closer to home. What miracle did he do in your life? Well, here's a big one. He saved you. Yeah. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Romans 10 and 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Titus 3 verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now that we've established that our God is powerful, all-powerful, let's look at something else very exciting. And I want to go to Romans chapter 8, verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. I got on this a little bit Wednesday night, and I said, man, I'm holding back the reins. I'm trying not to go too far. But this gets me excited because, you see, I remember that there were some stories way back. You go back in the Old Testament, and I remember a story where they marched around a, a city six days in a row. One time, nothing happened. Matter of fact, Joshua, according to the Word of God, would not tell them how many days they had to march. You might not have known that. He didn't say, okay, we're going to march six days, and then on the seventh. No. It was play by play. It was day by day. I'm telling you what to do today, but not tomorrow. you got to trust me. So here they go around the first day, and they're marching around. They're thinking, well, something good's going to happen. God never has us just do stuff in vain. We've been faithful. We obeyed. We made it through the wilderness uh, journey. Our mamas and daddies died, but we remained faithful. Uh, Moses died, but we remained faithful. Joshua was raised up to lead us. We know something good's going to happen. And after the first day, nothing happened. They went back home. Went to their tents. Second day, same thing. Third day, Joshua's not letting up on the game plan. He's not saying, I got a fourth quarter Hail Mary pass coming your way. It's going to be a miracle. Blow Jericho's mind. He didn't say that. Six days, same thing. Don't you ask me anything except this. How many times do we march? One time, go do it. Play the instruments, but don't say anything. They're starting to wonder, what in the world's going on? Seventh day, the Bible says Joshua got up with a whole different instruction. He said, this time something big is going to happen. This time you're going to march around not one time but six, seven times. And on the seventh time, I need somebody in the congregation who knows how to shout to let out a shout because God's about to do a miracle. And you know what happened on the seventh time? You had a family with Rahab looking out a window thinking, my goodness, is this going to be the day? I don't know what we're going to do. We're running out of milk and bread and uh, Taco Bell ain't delivering no more. Pizza Hut done gave up on me. I, I can't get a Dr. Pepper for nothing to save my life. What we're going to do? And they're looking out the window and all of a sudden, Rahab feels the wall start to shake. And she, oh, this is it. Honey, the seventh time around, I feel something changing. And by the seventh time, the Bible tells us every wall, every portion of the wall fell down except for one. And it's where Rahab was standing there looking out the window. Now, I said all that to say this. The same Spirit of God that was present when the walls began to shake. The same Spirit of God who through His power sent waves of, uh, like an earthquake through the ground and it began to cause the walls to crumble. The same Spirit is in every born-again believer right now in this room. You know, it makes such a difference to me when I hear testimonies from a, a first-hand witness. When somebody says, I was there, Michael. I saw that person get up that was paralyzed. I saw it with my own eyes. It makes a difference to me. That I like reading books and reading stories and hearing what God's done, but it makes a difference to me when somebody says, I saw it with my own eyes. I was there. 
Every, mm, every time you start speaking about a story in the Word of God, you got a spirit inside you who was there. He was there. He felt what they felt. He tasted what they tasted. He heard what they heard. He saw what they saw. And that same spirit is in you tonight. And if you'll get some boldness of the Holy Ghost about you, when you start telling about the old rock of ages who died on an old rugged cross, you're not giving third-hand information. You're talking from a first-person point of view. My my God was there. He was in me. And if you'll let him in you, he'll save you too. It was a third day, Sister Hope. A third day. God seems to like the number three. He is, after all, known by us as the Trinity, Holy Father, Son, and Spirit. So it only seems right that on the third day there was a tomb sitting there, right? It wasn't even owned by Jesus or Mary or, or his daddy who probably had departed. Not one of them owned it. It wasn't like Jesus took out a mortgage. It wasn't like he went to the bank and said, hey, I'm going to need this soon, so uh, let's make sure I put a down payment on this grave. My goodness, as much as graves cost now, it took a fortune probably. Anybody, can I get an amen on that? But on the third day, as angels stood guard, on the third day, as demons began to shake, on the third day, as Satan himself, who ruled hell and had dominion over death and the earth, had to watch as the Messiah who had come down to paradise was no longer going to be restrained in paradise. He was going to carry paradise up to a place called heaven and that wasn't the end of the story because somebody needed to know Jesus actually got back up uh, out of the grave. So he came and rose from the dead and the Bible says that on the third day there was an angel who had one of the most awesome jobs ever in the history of the world. Here comes an angel. I don't know his name, but one day we'll find out. But the Bible tells us that the angel came, and when he appeared, his raiment, his garment was like lightning. The Roman soldiers had never seen a show like this before. It was so overpowering that when they saw him, the Bible says they shook. Now, this wasn't Jesus. This wasn't the Father of the Holy Ghost. This was just an angel. And, and if I'm going I'm to tell you right now, if God's got that much glory for an angel, oh, let me go. I, I know I want to finish about the resurrection, but let me say this right quick. If God's got that much glory for an angel, guess what? how much glory he's got for you God because he said when you see him we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is angels ain't got nothing on you when God transforms you into his likeness angels are going to have to stand back and say oh wow that's a child of the king third day here comes the angel says that the Roman soldiers shook and became like dead men. They had been trained. They were the Green Berets. They were the Navy SEALs. They were the best of the best. The elite. These weren't some wimps. These weren't some kids that were trained last week and just got out of the academy. These were uh, soldiers who were stalwart, strong warriors. The Bible says with an appearance of one angel whose garment was like lightning that those soldiers fell as dead men. And then the Bible tells us something awesome began to happen. That on that same day, the angel began to touch the stone and with ease he rolled that stone out from the cover of the tomb and, and, and I like this right here it makes me think of the Fonzie <coughs> and happy days Bible says as soon as he rolled the stone away he sat on it <laughs> come on somebody y'all remember happy days happy days just got spiritual hallelujah <coughs> he did like the Fonzie he sat on it The same Holy Ghost that raised your Messiah from the dead is in you right now. You've got a first-hand witness, first-person account. When you start talking about the resurrection and the Holy Ghost starts taking over you, it's not you giving third-person reports anymore. It's not CNN or Fox News. It's not some uh, Jewish historian like Josephus. It's the Holy Ghost speaking. And when he speaks, he speaks with power because he was there and he knows what he's talking about. Somebody give him praise. Hallelujah. We are children of the Most High God, and we serve a God who is all-powerful. 
Not only is the Holy Ghost within us, but so is Jesus. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. Galatians 2 and 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but guess what? Christ lives within me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know why a child of God does not have to give in to pressure of people who are making fun of Christianity, holiness, church, and the Bible? It's because the power of God and his spirit remain in you. And the spirit of God doesn't back down to any devil. Oh, hallelujah. Do you know why that when Christians are killed by ISIS, and I'm not talking about a guillotine, I'm speaking of a knife that they are beheaded by. You've seen the videos and the images over in Egypt, the Coptic Christians who stood firm in the faith. You know why they're able to give their lives and to sit there and kneel there while somebody literally cuts their head off with a knife? It's because God himself is within them and no amount of torture or pain can change their mind that God is the same yesterday, today, forever, that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven and there's nothing, no temporary re reprieve from death that's worth backsliding on the Lord. Amen. John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. God desires for you to be his house, his home, his place of residence. That's a wonderful thing. When Jesus left earth, he told his disciples that somebody very powerful was on the way. Acts 1 and 8. We spoke a little bit about this this morning. That you shall receive power. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, he said power. Glory to God. When the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We've been underestimating the Holy Ghost. Because Jesus said, when I send him, he's coming with power. I'm ready to get back to the types of move of, of the Lord where we see power evident in the church of the living God. Amen? Well, we do here. We've seen many times God moves, so it's not like it would be an odd thing. But I, I'm not satisfied. I'm ready for cars to be lined up pulling in there saying my, uh, I, I've got a crippled I, I've got somebody paralyzed I've got somebody that's dying of cancer can you pray can you lay hands on them they need healing we're about to file bankruptcy I need help financially can you pray for us that God give us wisdom to know how to how spend our money and at the same time pray he'll send us a miracle People are going to be coming in there saying, I'm right at the point of blowing my head off. I'm ready to give up on life. I don't have anything to live for. My wife's left me. I've lost my job. I'm addicted to this and to that. Somebody better help me or I'm going to end up in hell tonight. And those are the type of people that I'm praying God will send to these church doors. And when they get in here, they'll hear the gospel message and they'll realize hope is just inside. Jesus is still on the throne. Help is on the way. And there is hope in his name is Jesus. It's what we're asking the Lord to do. We're praying that God will mobilize us as a force to be reckoned with. And when we leave this house every week, that we'll go out and take the same gospel we, we shout about here, take that same gospel to the world. It's the will of God. But he said that I will send you, you shall receive, he said, power. You know, when I hear that, it makes me think less of the devil. Isn't that wonderful? It makes me think so much less of the devil. Because I realize he doesn't have quite as much power as he's been bragging about. You see, he's tried to tell us that he's got so much power over us, we're never going to get out of our, our debt. We're never going to uh, get healed. We're, we're never going to experience our breakthrough. It, it's always going to be like this. Might as well get used to it. Life's going to be miserable. Things are going to be rough. But I serve a God who speaks the opposite of my enemy. He speaks favor and blessings. He speaks that he gives us an anointing that can break the yoke of bondage. He gives us an anointing that sets the captive free. He gives us an anointing that when somebody gets up here on this stage and sings, it's not just some boring thing like somebody's in a box like a robot. No, they might not always hit every note on key, but I'll guarantee you this. When the anointing's here, you'll feel it run all the way through your feet up to your hands, and somebody has to stand up and say, Sing that one more time. God's doing something in my life. It's the anointing church that makes 
the difference. I believe full well, completely, that if there were no anointing in this ministry, these doors would be shut unless there was probably a business here now. It's only by God's power and anointing that your lives have been changed. It's only by His grace, His power, and His anointing and His divine will that you have reached so many souls in the last few years. Mm. That you have been allowed to work in whatever ministry God's opened up for you to do. And it's by His grace and His mercy and His anointing and power that you've had the influence you've had. I thank Him for that. Ephesians 3 verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. What power is this? We've already shared many examples. But one power he gave you was the power of free will. Unless you're a child who was threatened with a hickory or a belt, you probably didn't have to be here tonight. There's some children that were like, well, I didn't have a choice. A lot of them's got their minds on school, and meeting up with friends tomorrow, having, having a good old time. And I was being funny about that, about threatened by a belt. But you don't have to be here. But you chose of your own free will. You didn't even have to be a Christian. You could have acted like some of your hoodlum friends. Well, let me change that. Some of your hoodlum family members. <laughs> your wild heathen family members. And you could have just lived like a crazy life. You know that relative I'm talking about right now. Yeah, all of you's got one. The drunk, the druggie, the one that sleeps around all the time. Uh, you, you know where I'm going. You, the one you try to ignore sometimes. Well, we'll invite them to Christmas. You still got to love them, amen. Ben, I must be hitting a nerve up here. <laughs> he might have more than one. Pray for him. <laughs> the Lord's blessed us to have free will. And with that free will is our amazing opportunities. You've got the free will to go out and get yourself an education, to get a degree. You've got the free will a lot of times to choose where you work and who you work for and, uh-oh, how you do the job you have, how you perform on the job. You've got a free will. You can be the kind of person just does enough to pass, just does enough to get a C plus, just does enough to not get fired. Or you can be someone who, I said something to Brother Ricky the other day. We was at a place and the people just were doing a sorry job. I think we went out to eat or something, but I won't say where. They don't always do the best job when you go out to eat. Hallelujah. I said, Brother Ricky, I wish everybody would take the attitude. Oh, I remember where it was now. I'm not going to say. I, I, I said, I wish everybody would get the attitude that, like they own the business that they work for. And I don't mean be bossy and take over. But to have the attitude that I want to please every customer because I actually want folks to come back here and want to come back here. You know, in, in other words, to, to recommend us. And when you own a business, you think differently because every customer is so important. They don't have to walk through your store door. They don't have to buy from you. So you're thankful for every one of them. But when you're working for about 7 bucks an hour, it's just, oh, man, here comes another one. Ugh. Man, I hope, they, I hope they don't order a double cheeseburger. I hope it's just a regular hamburger. I'm so fed up with double cheeseburgers and no onions. I mean, it, it's amazing the difference of the attitude when you don't own the business. Now, I'm not saying everybody's like that because a Christian, a Christian, I think they hit it. There you go. A Christian behaves in such a way that whether the boss is around or not, you do your best. Amen. That's what is going to be preached at New Haven. That's what God expects of his people all around the world. He said the power that works within us. What other kind of power is there? There's miracle working power. I did some reading on Reverend Smith Wigglesworth. Most of you probably have heard the name. Two different stories in particular that I read about. One, he visited a farm. This was decades ago. I don't remember the exact year. But he went to a farm and he asked the farmer how things were going. He said, the, the crop looks good. And the farm, farmer spoke up and he said, no, sir. He said, Brother Wigglesworth, he said, we're going to lose the whole crop because of blight. Now, blight is a type of fungi, fungi that uh, plagues an entire field. And once it hits, it spreads so rapidly, it's hard to stop it. And many times it'll wipe out an entire field. 
so like anointed people of God, Brother Smith Wigglesworth said, we're going to pray. The story said that, and this is true, he lifted up his hand and he said, in the name of Jesus, heal this field. In the name of Jesus, he began praying for that field. He said he heard back from that farmer very quickly, and he said, I, I don't understand this, Brother Wigglesworth, but every bit of the blight has, ooh, glory, has disappeared. And months later, he came back and told Brother Wigglesworth, he said, we're about to have the best crop we've ever had in the history of this farm. <laughs> Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? That was another story found in one of his books. Brother Wigglesworth was called to a home. And there was a family there, and the child, it was a daughter, she was dying. Very young. I think she was close to Chloe's age, around 12. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've got a child around that age and your child's at the brink of death, it'll shake you up. It'll cause you to question a lot of things. It'll make you get, Brother Neil, what I call desperate. Make you get like that woman with the issue of blood. That woman who had been bleeding for 12 years and it was getting so bad, she was so weak, she didn't even know if she could make it to Jesus. But the Bible tells us she got down in between all that crowd and people could have easily pushed her out of the way and said, you're not worthy, you don't deserve to be here, what are you doing here? You can't touch the priest of God. What, don't you realize what you're doing? But yet the Bible says she pressed on and she made her way until she reached the hem of his garment. And the Bible says as soon as she did, Jesus felt something. The vir virtue of God flowed out of him. And he said, who touched me? With that same kind of faith, Brother Smith Wigglesworth walked into the house. Here's a daughter at the brink of death. And the mama and the brother were sitting there in the room. And he began to pray, and it felt like he was just fighting every force of the devil and hitting brick walls every way he turned. And he finally looked at the mom, and he says, Ma'am, you've got to leave this room. She says, I've been here for three weeks. I haven't even changed my clothes. I'm not going anywhere. Brother had the same attitude. I'm, I'm not leaving here. We've been praying. We've been believing. Brother Smith Wigglesworth grabbed his coat, put it on, and he said, Well, I'm out of here. I'm leaving now. And the mom said, oh, no, no, we'll go to our bedrooms. And you do whatever you need to do. And so he took his coat back off, and he said around 1130 that night, he began to really get down to business with the Lord. He prayed and interceded for four straight hours. Now, you want to find out why the old timers had something we don't? There's your answer. Mm. He didn't pray for 15 minutes and say, well, I guess God ain't going to do nothing. He prayed from 1130 p.m. to 3.30 a.m. When he got to that moment, something happened. He said that a paleness came over her, and she slipped away into death itself. I want to read his words right here. He said, it can't be. The devil said, now you are done for. This is the enemy speaking to him. You have come from Bradford and the girl has died on your hands. I said it can't be. God did not send me here for nothing. This is a time to change strength. I remembered that passage which said men ought always to pray and not faint. Death had taken place but I knew my God was all powerful. Oh there's that word. And he that had split the Red Sea is just the same today. You know what he did right there? He started testifying about something he had not seen but the Holy Ghost within him had. <laughs> it was a time when I would not have no, and God said yes. I looked at the window, and at that moment, the face of Jesus appeared. Woo, glory to God. It seemed as though a million rays of light were coming from his face. As he looked at the one who had just passed away, the color came back to her face, and she came back to life. Now, I don't always understand the way God works. This was kind of funny to me, but Brother Wigglesworth said as soon as she came back to life, she rolled over and went to sleep. So what does he do? He gets up and heads on. Family's still in the bed, still wondering what's going on. He gets a report that morning. The girl got up from her bedroom, walked into the living room. Everybody else is still asleep. And under the anointing, oh, hallelujah, sits down at the piano and begins playing and singing a song. The 
mama and the brother get awakened by the sound of a piano under the anointed power of the Holy Ghost and they get in there and rejoice at the miracle that God did. There's a power that we've barely tapped into. But it's going to take some prayer. Brother, you saying we earn the power of God? No, I am not. But I'm saying God expects you to kill your flesh, to get out of an attitude of microwave Christianity, to get out of an attitude it's either in the next five minutes or I'm out of here, God. Somebody's got to start praying like they used to. That goes for our altar services. You know, if we're going to start something, we might as well start it where we're preaching it. Amen. We got folks praying in the altar. We don't need to be talking about Big Macs and Happy Meals uh, three minutes into their uh, intercessory prayer. We need to be standing there, and if we're not praying for somebody, we need to keep our mouths shut and stand there and, and pray for them from where we're standing. Boy, that's pastoral. You want to take over? <laughs> we need to have a reverence again. We need to, and I'm not saying that I, I've noticed this because I've not, but I just want to make sure that I preach what we need to hear. And that is that we got to get back to prayer. We got to realize how powerful our God is. We got to understand the God who is in us is a first hand, first account witness of everything you read in that holy word of God. And that God's beckoning us to, if we really want an awakening in the United States of America, He's saying, get back to your prayer rooms. If you really want to see, me move with revival, go back to prayer. We about had revival at Southside High School today. There was an anointing to pray. I told Brother Colton, I, I looked at that stage in the auditorium, God allowed me to pray at the high school, which I was so honored, and to pray in the auditorium. <laughs> I told Colton, I said, I'm expecting us to be on that stage soon, speaking to this school. Whew. Hallelujah. I'm expecting, and I know that's a big thing to ask. But when I hear stories like a little 12-year-old girl is laying dead on a bed and God raises her from the dead, speaking to a school and seeing a thousand kids saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, just doesn't sound that hard anymore. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Woo, glory to God. My Lord, help me. we got to become a people of prayer again. People look at anointed men and women of God and they think man the stuff you talk about sounds so crazy why don't you think about Walmart and Gregerson's and Winn-Dixie and, and uh, uh, Hawaii Five-0 uh oh I went back back in time a little bit there and talk about your TV shows and everything else and, and that's okay it's okay to, to enjoy things of the world and it's okay to eat brother Neil hallelujah but somebody's got to push some things out of the schedule again and get back to just old time holiness and start living the way mom and daddy used to live. Not getting under rituals or tradition, but getting back to a place where you care what God thinks about your life. Woo, my Lord. Oh, Where you care what God thinks about your life. Man, it's like God just opened up a vision to me, Brother Gary. I just saw something big. I saw somebody grabbing hold of the words being spoken today. And it was like their prayer life so radically changed that God began doing miraculous things, not from them standing in front of huge crowds, but from their prayer room. Now, I know that hits me different than you because I just saw something. You're, you're hearing it, but I saw it. I saw somebody that was growing in faith at such an accelerated rate that their prayer life became a war life and that mountains were moved and demons trembled and miracles took place from the prayer room. Mm, man, I feel like somebody from out of this world right now, but here's the good part. There's going to be someone who's going to relate to me in the next few weeks because I'm talking about you. Somebody's about to become a prayer warrior. In this room, oh, Lord, help us. I know it feels like I'm kind of going long. I, I want to be careful. I don't want to tire you out or wear you out, but I want to make sure we let the Lord say what he's going to say. God said, get back to a place of prayer. Get back to a burden for lost souls. When you first got saved, don't you remember that feeling you had? And it bubbled inside you and said, you said, man, I've got to tell somebody about what Jesus is doing in me. I've got to tell somebody 
about how he saved me from my sins. I got to let them know that I was on my way to hell, but now I'm going to heaven. I'm going to spend eternity with the Lord because Jesus saved my soul. I hope I'm hitting a nerve right now with somebody because Jesus is saying you got to get back to your first love. you got to get back to where I'm more important than anything else in your life. you got to get back to where you want to spend more time with me than you want to in front of your television or your computer. you got to get back to wanting to get into my word more than you want to get onto your cell phone. you got to get back to my glory. you got to get back to worship. you got to get back to prayer. you got to get back to holiness. you got to get back to Holy Ghost town meeting. you got to get back to the mercy. Miraculous. Oh, Sitara Mama Yandarama Sutarama Shaya. My God, you gotta get back. We gotta get back. We gotta get back. We gotta get back. We gotta get back. Brother Gary, our parents and our grandparents had something that some of us still haven't grabbed a hold of. They had something real. They had something that made them live different than many of us are living today. They had something that caused them to want to fall in love with Jesus all over again and actually share the gospel with people that they were around during the day. They had the goods. And so can you. Stand with me. Somebody in this room is bowling over to be asked to come up and pray. Somebody in this room is wanting to pray so bad. I'm not talking about getting saved. You're already saved. And if you're here and you don't know the Lord, you're always welcome to come up and confess sins and accept the Lord. But that's not what I'm feeling right now. I feel like somebody's just saying, just call us up to pray, Pastor. I got to get real with Jesus. (laughs) I got to get real with Jesus. Come on up. Come on up, church. I hope everybody everybody prays. Y'all come on up. I'm talking to everybody. The whole church. Get alone with Jesus right now. Get alone with Jesus. Get real with the Lord. Oh, pour your soul out to the one who saved you when you weren't worth two cents. Pour yourself out to the one who you used to be so in love with and nobody could take it from you. The one who you sang about and you talked about and you witnessed about and you loved on. Come back to that Lord. Reestablish your commitment to Him. Get back to where you used to be. Oh, thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this place. My God, speak to your people, I pray. Speak to your people. Lord, speak to your people. Yeah, come on, people of God, pray. Ain't nobody can pray like you. Can't nobody pray like you. 